Today, many people are thinking about Memorial Day and that's tomorrow. And some people think it's just a time where you wear red, white, and blue. Some people will be drunk off the rocker later on today in celebration of Memorial Day. Others think of it as just a holiday, just a holiday where they're off of work. For me, it's a little bit more. I hope it is for you as well. We lost a lot of, a lot of men during the Civil War and shortly after the Civil War, 1865, they started to celebrate Memorial Day. It wasn't necessarily memorialized as a national holiday until 1972. Having been a soldier, I know that this day is not very pleasant for many. We say happy Memorial Day to someone as if we have no clue what's going on. This day for many is a heartbroken wife that has a memory of her husband. And this day reminds her of the two officers that came to her home. And she knew what it meant. I just pray that this Memorial Day, that it'd just be more than some holiday. We've lost a lot in this nation. We most certainly lost a lot of patriotism. There are a lot of men and women that have died for our country so that we can eat hot dogs and others can drink beer and say, happy Memorial Day. I just don't want us to forget that there's those that are hurting today. That this is a memory of someone that they loved very dearly. They're long, no longer with them. They sacrificed their life so that we could have the freedom so that uh, our constitutional rights, as we understand them, our freedom of religion would be preserved, which we're exercising today. It has cost something. It's cost lives. So when we think of this day, Memorial Day, if you can think of anybody that you need to give a call to, just tell them that you're thinking about them and that you're praying for them. It wouldn't be a bad thing to do. I think as a pastor too, it's a little bit difficult when we look at the church today because so much damage has been done to the church and we've lost so many in the fight. We see the church uh, almost wandering around in America, very uh, impotent in many ways. This, uh, this area of study that I've been in has been a burden to my heart and the Lord has just told me to preach truth. And so I want to do that. I am tired of the contention in the church, tired of the bitterness, I'm tired of the division that we see in the church at large, but I'm here to tell you that truth divides. Truth brings unity, but truth divides. It separates truth from error. And so being a preacher of the word is a little bit difficult at times because it requires me to preach truth. And truth in the face of error, it's rejected. And most of what we're seeing in our society today is almost operating entirely in error. People are calling good bad and bad good. And people don't know what their gender is. And people in churches have no earthly idea what they believe. And they believe all kinds of different things. And you watch seducing spirits enter in and watch a church get devoured and watched a sermon this past week of a Lutheran preacher and she made some of the most blasphemous comments that I've ever heard in my life. And I can't believe that people didn't stand up and walk out of the church when she said that Jesus and the Phoenician woman, this was one of his biggest mistakes that he's ever made. He was a total screw up when he was talking with her. And I thought, what outright blasphemy but yet everybody sat there and just agreed and listened i thought my goodness have we gone that far to where you can say the sinless son of god was the biggest screw up when he was talking about her and actually used language that i'm that's not appropriate from the, pu the pulpit but referred to her as a female dog from the pulpit that Jesus called her that. I thought, wow, have we really gone so far that people will sit in filth and worship Jesus? 
And I thought, well, in some places. I pray not here, amen? amen. So in this, last week we had talked about uh, the abundant life. and I hope that you know my heart is that I am looking and longing for the day when the Lord returns. And I'm seeing more and more that those days are coming. And I would like to talk about eschatology and help correct some eschatology, uh, if it's at all possible, just for a moment. And that is that many in the church today in the new apostolic reformation are talking about this great revival that's going to come to the world. I hope that they're wrong because they're so filled with demons that it's unbelievable. But as far as eschatology is concerned, what we're going to see is we're going to see an apostasy. We're going to see a great falling away. We're going to see uh, the book of Revelation begin to unfold before our eyes. And I'm hoping that cross life doesn't just fall asleep. Just because they've capitulated just a little bit on some of the pressure that they placed on us. Do not hit the snooze button. Do not go to sleep. Because the next thing will come very rapidly, very fast, and it'll catch you off guard if you allow it. This economy is not going to stay where it's at right now. I pray that you're prepared, spiritually, in your hearts. I'm thankful that the Lord is going to provide for us and protect us in, in supernatural ways beyond what, what we even conceive to think of asking him for because we're his children. But what we peddle here in America towards the world is almost goofy. I've said it before that this pastor believes that American Christianity is almost entirely wrong. Almost entirely wrong. You know, as we sing those songs today, in Spanish, how many of you had a, a weird feeling in your spirit? Anybody? Yeah. It's because you're not exposed to it. You haven't maybe gone overseas and worshiped with others who have, that's the only language that they spoke, but you knew the words so you could actually interpret it as worship in your mind. And so I'm hoping that we can expand into the knowledge of who Christ is and that we can worship him in different ways, because that's all that you are trying to expose us to. And you've, you've experienced it. I've experienced it before. Singing songs that were being sung in Creole, but yet I knew to stand up and to worship the Lord and raise my hands and praise him because I knew what the, I, I knew what the words were. Now, I knew them in English, although they're being sung in a different language. I say all that because some of the things that I'm going to, to be talking about are going to seem strange. But what we did this morning in worship, nothing was wrong with that. It was true worship. It happened to be in another language that maybe you didn't understand. So as we talk about some of these things, you have been raised up and you have learned things that you might have to unlearn. You might. You might. I don't want to be too militant about this, although I do miss the military in many ways. In the military, we had standard operating procedures and we all followed those. In the church, that's not the case. You follow whatever, whatever, a lot of times. And we had army regulations and those were regulations that were established and set and you memorized them and you followed them to a T. And it made it a lot easier. And then as I understand scripture and as I read it, I see how much out there that they don't use this as a standard operating procedure. They use this as their operating procedure. And then they take what their thoughts are and make God's word say what they want it to say. In these last days, brothers and sisters, that trash isn't gonna fly. I'm telling you right now, when you're speaking the words of God, demons will flee. If you're submitted to Christ, you will speak the true words of Christ and they will flee. But if you're speaking some gibberish and some jumbo, mumbo, jumbo craziness that was made up by this NAR and the word of faith. Listen, I think that demons won't have a problem backing away for a moment. 
and allowing you to look like you're doing something. I think that we need to get very serious about God's word in these last days. That's all. I started thinking about the NAR and what they're wanting to do. And it's, it, it's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. It's just happened to be something that they've, they've coined it with. That they're going to be putting together some kind of ecumenical movement. And we know that it's going to be a one world government, right? We know that there's going to be a one world government. We also know that there's going to be people that stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're going to say, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many wonderful works in your name? Did we not do all these miracles in your name? And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to say, I never knew you. Get away from me, you worker of iniquity. I'm not saying that anybody here is in that place. I, I, I've, I've talked with you. I've sat down. I've had conversations with you. And there's no doubt that you love the Lord Jesus Christ. I can make that judgment based on our conversations. It's a righteous judgment. I've talked with others and I know for a fact they're lost, as lost as they can be. We're not going to talk about the passage of scripture out of Matthew chapter 7 today, but about judgment, about making judgments. Did you know that if you ever tell me, hey, the Lord said don't judge, did you know that that's a judgment? Just to make that very statement? So how do we judge righteously? That'll be coming down, coming down the, the, the pike for sure. So in this, this happens to deal with how we pray. Now, I'm not here to dictate how you pray. Everybody prays very specifically. They have their own personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you pray in a certain way. I've spoken on tongues and tongues in service before to other churches. What you do in your prayer closet with the Lord, that's entirely up to you and the Lord. I hope that it edifies you if it's in tongues. But here I want to edify the church. So I want to speak words of understanding so that you can hear it, so that the church is strengthened because of it. Amen? I'm not going to be talking about that today either, but it's coming. What I want to talk about today is a, a way that we pray that is unbiblical. It's unscriptural. And it's something that we've learned as a church because it sounds authoritative but it's trash. It actually has no place in the church. Isn't that crazy to even say that? In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, and then we're going to look at a couple of passages. So that's Acts 20, 35, and Mark chapter 11, verse 24, and Matthew 21, 22. I'll go back over those. Well, we're going to look at a few of these and then we're going to look how mysticism has actually gotten into the Christian prayer life, how new thought has entered into the church. And it is a doctrine of a demon for us to think otherwise. And so I'm in great prayer and have been to a place of exhaustion at times that this demonic spirit would leave this church and retain every single soul. Amen. We're out in the world today and we're talking with a lot of folks who are really twisted with a lot of crazy theology. And we have to be in a place where we're strong enough, not only to have this brother or this sister in our lives, but that we wouldn't necessarily succumb to the, to the seducing spirits or the doctrines of demons that they have latched onto. And I'm hopeful that as we do grow, that we won't get devoured in the process. I'm hoping, I'm hoping. So in this, it is this, uh, the Lord says in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, and, and it's obviously something that, uh, that John had written down that the Lord himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It's a simple statement and it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a place where we start off in prayer. Is it's more blessed to give than to receive. In Mark chapter 11, verse 24, it says, Therefore I say unto you, whatso things ever you desire when you pray, Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. 
And then in Matthew 21, 22, it says, all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Now this all sounds wonderful, except that what's being taught in like word of faith, for instance, is this sowing of a seed into a ministry kind of a thing and taking this whole mindset that yes, we do, we do reap what we sow, but to give in expectation of receiving something is not why the believer gives. We give because the blessing, the blessing is that we have given. It is, it is more of a blessing for us to give. When I minister to people, I want to give. I don't expect anything in return. I don't expect platitudes. I don't expect the pats on the back. As a matter of fact, some of those um, are just that. They're just platitudes because nothing that was actually said actually affected their hearts. They're just saying, hey, that was a good message. I like the way you orated. I like the way you put it together. That was a great illustration that you used. Things like this, as opposed to their hearts actually being transformed. I've gotten everything I'm going to get and it comes from Jesus. And I am so thankful for all that I've received from him is that all I can do is give. And it is more of a blessing for me to give than to receive. Then why is it in our prayers, we actually pray covetously? We're always praying for what we want and what we think we should have. And we take these two passages of scriptures on top of this, where it says, therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believing that you shall receive them, you will have them. And so how do we pray? We pray, well, I just, I need to pray louder. I need to, to, to use my, the tonality of my voice to be able to get this emphasis across and almost convince myself to believe that I deserve these things and then ask God for them. And if we believe enough, then we'll actually receive them because the word says that whatsoever we desire when we pray, believing that we will receive them. It's like when I was teaching Christians to drive and said that uh, one of the instructions in everything that I told him was to yield on left turns. And that's the only thing he did. So everywhere he went, he only took left turns, yielding every time and just drove in a circle. You would think, well, you didn't get all of the instruction, did you? All of the revelation of what I had shared with you about how to drive. It's the same way with us when we pray. We take certain things and we pop those out and we place those as preeminent. And then we think if we can believe enough, then we're going to receive these things that we desire, that we want and it's a form of idolatry and covetousness before the Lord. And we don't realize it. And I'll tell you right now, the Lord is very gracious to us. He is very merciful to us. He is very patient toward us. But we often pray in such a way that we define what God's will is. And it just so happens to be ours. And it shouldn't be that way. Because the desires of our heart are the ones that should bend to his desires. And so the way that we pray when we're, when we're bending to his will and his desires, then it will be praying according to his will, would it not? So I know that, uh, and, we'll, and we'll get there. Um, and we will get there. So in Matthew 21, 22, it says, and all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. This almost, as far as the new age is concerned, it's, it's like calling out to the universe and that we're going to get whatever we want or whatever we desire because we confirm that we believe and then we add in Jesus' name to the back of it as a little cap to make sure that it gets done. 
And so what we're called to do is we're, we're called to pray in the authority of his name. Not just to add his name as some little cliche to the end of our prayers, but that brothers and sisters, we're to be operating in Christ, that his desire is our desire. And sometimes the way that we pray for things is very selfish, if we're honest. And sometimes we don't know how we ought to pray. And these are times where we can enter into our prayer closet and we can call out to the Lord. And many people have done this, me included. And we speak to the Lord in a way that would edify us because we lack understanding. But when I hear corporate prayers, I hear very selfish prayers a lot of time where they're picking all kinds of scripture out to make themselves sound like they know what they're talking about. When in, when in reality, this pastor is going, this person doesn't actually know what they're talking about. They actually don't understand the scriptures and they're, they're taking things out and thinking, and it's very close without saying it, that they have this incommunicable attribute of God in that they can create things with their words. And they begin to speak these things. Brothers and sisters, I don't know when this thing's going to happen. I do know that there's going to come a time where there's going to be a dispersion. And it could very well happen in America. And this pastor is not going to be here. But I'm telling you right now, if you will get serious about God's word and you will begin to talk with him, not in some way that you learn sometime, but you actually get to this place where you're speaking with authority, you're going to need him. Sometimes I hear people pray in such a way that they almost put themselves preeminent in the prayer even above God, that they're operating with such high level of authority that they might even take passages of scripture out that, uh, that say greater things will we do than him, than Jesus. And they actually speak from that place, that higher plane of authority. Brothers and sisters, please stop doing this. Please understand that we can do nothing, nothing apart from him. And when we pray, there should be a place where we are in absolute communion with him when we pray. Amen. It's never separated. It's never apart. There's never a time where we're going to be operating solo. We have to have him at all times. When we've gone to other countries, our church in Pakistan, which I, I don't, I've done this, them, them a disservice in not talking more about how they're loving the Lord under persecution because we don't see it. We don't have it in our own lives. There is a connection to him that, that, that they're operating in daily that we don't as American Christians. We just don't. This is why the church today is so impotent. There's a lot of declarations of what God's going to do, but nothing happens. And we can talk about that all day long, but I pray that we would get to a place where we wouldn't adopt the law of attraction into our prayer life. Speaking to some cosmic genie that's going to do whatever we want at our whim. We don't manipulate God. We're not called to manipulate God. God is wanting to actively use us and work through us. Amen. And the, the, the perfect communication with him is prayer. And sometimes it requires pleading. Sometimes. Has anybody ever begged God for an outcome? Anybody? I remember when my son was going through something and I was playing the guitar in my room, crying over a song, pleading with the Lord. He didn't condemn me for it. That was probably one of the most... The times when we're in most distress is oftentimes that it's the most intimate conversations that we can have with the Lord. And most American churches haven't suffered any real persecution. So they've adopted so many other things aside from this intimate communication with the Lord. Sadly, 
Most people, when they pray, they're saying it's better to get than to give. You can almost tell sometimes when you're talking with somebody, when you're ministering to somebody and they don't respond the way you thought that they should. And if it caused some offense as you're ministering or giving to them and it's not reciprocated the way that you thought and you feel like, wow, I can't believe, very well maybe the wrong motivation that you're ministering to them. It's not easy talking about this, but this law of attraction has worked its way into the church today. And we treat God as if he's our servant instead of us being his servant. Does that make sense, anybody? One of the messages that hardly ever gets preached from a pulpit is covetousness. And we are very selfish people. And we, we are very covetous a lot of times. What's in it for me? What can I do? Talked with a brother today, army buddy, and uh, going through a, a very difficult time. And I did, not, I, I did not know this, but he's watching the videos and it's ministering to him through these difficult times. And he sent one off to his dad. And his dad said, finally, a preacher that's preaching the truth. And I thought, well, that's one person. I don't think my messages are very popular in these last days. But if I talked about, hey, just call out to the Lord and he'll give you the, he'll give you whatever. If you believe enough, he will give you whatever your heart desires. My prayer is that God's people's desires change. The desire isn't for this, uh, health and wellness and prosperity. This life is a vapor and it is almost over. We have got to get our eyes on Jesus and focus on him and what his word says. And in these last days, there's power in his name and there's power in his word, but there's not gonna be a power in any bobblehead Jesus that you're, that you're worshiping or words out of context to create your own theology. There's not going to be any power in that. Satan tried that with Jesus in the wilderness. How'd that go? Jesus refuted the very words that he said with truth. Satan is a deceiver. And in these last days, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you right now, there's going to be such a deception that comes across the land that if it were not shortened, even the elect would fall for it. That's you. That's me. That's us. That means that there's coming a great deception, which means that part of this ecumenical movement that we're seeing, and I want to see unity in truth. I don't want to see unity in anything else other than truth. That's God's word. That's Jesus. And that's his Holy Spirit. Not another spirit, not another Jesus, not some mutilated scriptures. But there's going to be a one world government that's going to form. We see all the other elements that are forming around us. And I got to thinking, and maybe I'm wrong, but that this, this ecumenical, Catholic, Islamic, word of faith, NAR, the way they had the Pope praying over Kenneth Copeland and all this other stuff, that, that it's ushering in this time where there's going to be great miracles that are done. And the, ultimately the... the, the uh, the, the, the prophet, see, the, 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 the even, even the name prophets have been coming up here lately. Over the past probably five to ten years, there have been more prophets in, in modern time than there had been since Scripture. And yet here we are, and people are buying into this and latching on and adopting these, these doctrines of demons. And they're moving into this ecumenical movement. And I'm telling you what, the remnant is a remnant. The remnant's a remnant. I'm not saying that we're the only ones, but I'm telling you right now, we need to take heed because there are seducing spirits that are trying to get us without a shadow of a doubt. And this, by the very word seducing, they are saying things that soothe us, that feed our flesh, that make us feel better 
that make us feel more authoritative than we actually are, even to the point that word of faith is saying that they're gods, that they're little gods, that they really believe that they're little gods. And then some that will fall just short of that will do everything as if they were God, even in their prayer lives, but won't say those blasphemous words, I am God. I'm not God, but I serve the only living God. And everything in our lives should gravitate towards edifying him and exalting him and not ourselves. Amen? I hope so. I hope so. The law of attraction is really about covetousness. People that put together vision boards, I, I understand how psychology works. I don't talk a lot about it from here, but obviously if you can activate your reticular activation system and you can focus on something that's important, then you're gonna begin seeing it everywhere. And these people are saying that if I can believe, if I can believe, if I can believe, then I can conceive. I can get these things that the Lord will give them to me. And you'll be working towards those things. You will be doing it. I'm um, kind of against these vision boards at this point in time because I see a lot of covetousness in those things. Psychological deception that you're actually playing on yourself. And it's rooted in covetousness. It is. It's about what I want to get. Everything that people mostly put on some kind of vision board is material things. And this, this life is fading away, brothers and sisters. Our treasures are supposed to be where? Here on earth? Uh, what's that? Oh, in heaven. <laughs> Amen. Amen. First Timothy chapter six and verse five just makes a statement supposing that great gain is godliness. And so what you'll hear is so into this ministry. I'm telling you right now, even when I first heard that, I thought that is absolute manipulation. Do I think that we should tithe? Do I think that we should do, uh, have offerings? Do I think that we should be supporting one another? Do I think that we should be supporting ministers? Absolutely, of course I do. And I'm sure you do as well. But if I started making up some stuff or you sewed into this ministry and you're going to get something back, that's manipulation. That's complete manipulation because it's only money. What I, want to, what I want you to sow into this ministry is truth. What I want you to sow into this ministry is your time and your talent and your gifts. Amen? Because this ministry is about Jesus Christ. And if it just so happens that you feel inclined to support it financially, hallelujah. We don't pass around an offering plate it's between you and God and the offering box just sits in the back. That's entirely up to you. I do know that that's usually the last part of a person that gets saved is their pocketbook. But aside from that, aside from that, great gain does not equal godliness. Godliness equals contentment. Are you content? I'm not saying that we don't desire more of God, that we don't desire the good gifts, but are you content? I am. I'm learning to be content. Is anybody else in that process of learning to be content? Amen. I just know, and I said this last week, that new age and this new thought and word of faith believe that there's a lot of power in words. And there are power in words. The very words that I'm saying today are either conflicting with you, convicting you, or comforting you. And there's power in those words. It has an effect on you, and I know that. And so I, I try to be very circumspect. But at the same time, truth is truth and error is error. And I pray that we can understand God's word enough to where we wouldn't change God's words. Because if words do have power, and these are the words of Almighty God given to us, then how dare we change them 
to make them mean what we want them to mean to serve our own purposes. These have been given to us a beautiful gift. This is the believer's instructions before leaving earth. You ever heard that? This is our standard operating procedure. This is the regulations that we have. Some people would refer to it as a love letter. And there's certain parts in the Old Testament that are hard to see that, but okay. Definitely, God is a God of love. In these last days, I just, uh, I'm sensing in my spirit and maybe according to my eschatology in end times that we are danger close, danger close worldwide. Did anybody listen to anything that brother Rick said Thursday night? (laughs) I mean, hello, these things are happening right now all around us. Now here's the blessing. I'm not concerned about it. You know what that means? The Lord is coming. And some people, they really don't want the Lord to come. They want to be able to get their house or their car or that job or their retirement account or something else. I'm personally ready for the Lord to return. But I also understand that for that to take place, some difficult days are ahead of us. As a matter of fact, it's gonna be as if the days of Noah showed back up again. There is gonna be a a, a, a anti-Christ spirit. There is going to be persecution. There is going to be peril. There is going to be famine. There is going to be a one world government. There's gonna be a one world currency and there's gonna be a one world religious system all of which I do not want to be a part of. And so it may require me to identify with Christ in his suffering during those times. And I'm prayerful, prayerful, but not confident that there will be a revival. And I will continue to preach truth of who Jesus is and the saving grace that he provides. And only he provides it. but I would rather see the book of Revelation unfold. Revelation unfold. Is anybody ready to see the Lord return? Well, he says, when he returns, will I find faith? Because there will be people that will be doing things with the tagline in Jesus' name. And they'll be doing things where other spirits are affecting the environment aside from the Holy Spirit. And they will make claims before the Almighty. Did we not do this, that, and the other in your name? And he will say, I never knew you. Those people are going to abound in the last days. I'm, I'm thankful that with this small remnant that we have here, I'm prayerful that you're strong enough. I'm prayerful that you can see what God's word is. I pray that you wouldn't be so filled with pride that you can't see his word. I ask the Lord daily, do you want me to just be an evangelist? Do you want me to go out? Because these messages are almost evangelical messages that another preacher at some other church might appreciate his people hearing. And you guys are like, "Ah, I'm tired of hearing this preacher. My goodness. Psalm 37, 4, 6, 11. Psalm 37, 4 is the place where we get to delight ourselves also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. I want for our hearts to line up with his heart and his desire is to return soon. And I, Every sign is indicating that he's coming. And if we can discern, the Lord Jesus said, if we can discern the skies and see that a storm is coming, then we should be able to discern the times that we're in today. 
now. Maybe I'm just really buying into the fact that the Lord's returning soon and it's kind of amped me up. I'm not interested in a big ministry. I'm interested in, in souls being saved. I'm not interested in getting a jet. I'm not interested in, in, in shacking up with some celebrity word of faith preacher as I'm seeing some. I'm interested in being true to God, Amen. preaching the truth. I want from my heart to match his heart and his desire. And I'm longing for his return. In Psalm 37, four, and you can do this yourself because this really is the key to prayer is getting our hearts aligned with his. Not manipulating, not trying to manipulate him by taking passages out of, out of, uh, out of context and then laying them at the foot of the Holy Spirit and thinking that he's obligated to answer those things because we prayed a certain way. But that our hearts would be aligned with his heart. And he shows us in Psalm 37, 4, uh, a, little, a little bit about how to do that. And for some of you, you may already know this. And so thank you for coming. Appreciate your time. For others, I hope that this is just a little bit of edification here because I kind of want to walk a little slow as I've been putting these things together because it hits on some things that, uh, that I know for a fact are affecting our church. I received a mug. I drink out of it at the house. It says, be careful what you say. What you say may be preached at a pulpit near you. And it's just pastor on it. I, I'm trying to remember who gave that to me. Anyway, but yeah, it's like, okay, <laughs> it's the real deal. Um, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. I just wrote down a few things on this one. If you read this, um, you'll see first and foremost, like this, huh? in verse three, trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou do well in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. The first thing is to trust in the only true and living God. Trust in him. This is what faith is, brothers and sisters. Faith is not some power that you can muster up. It's not some, something that you can build up inside of you. You either are trusting in him or you're not trusting in him. And it's being, it's being twisted into being, well, I need to increase my faith. With my wife, it took some time, but I had to increase her faith in me. It wasn't a, a quantity of, of some faith that she had in reserve in some bottle. It was that I had to do things that, that proved that I was worthy to be trusted. And so over time, she trusts me now. And I think that I could say that she probably trusts me uh, to the highest degree that you could give any person. And I have that reserve for her because she has been faithful. The Lord has done nothing to be unfaithful to us whatsoever. He is fully worthy of being trusted in every degree that we can muster. But yet the problem occurs is when we inject ourselves into the equation and we begin to trust ourselves or what we think or our intellect or our friends or our finances or even our thoughts or feelings. And there's a level of unbelief that develops that he's gonna be able to tackle this. Brother Michael has been very faithful to, to share in this, uh, in this transition that he's going through that there's, there's times where he said, Lord, help me with my unbelief. It's a very noble thing to say. It's a very humble thing to say. It's a very difficult thing for believers to say because it shows some weakness. Yet scripture tells us that Christ will show himself strong in our weaknesses. 
And I'm thankful that that's over for you, brother. We've all been in prayer. <laughs> Amen. He was transitioning to something and it was waiting to the very last 11th hour type event. And it was just like, Lord, I get some good news here. And it starts to carry me. And all of a sudden you continue to challenge my faith, which is my trust in you. Do I trust you? Do I trust you? Do I trust you? All the way up until the end. That's a beautiful thing. I pray that the Lord would, would stretch us that way. Often. Often. Sometimes I think the Lord is too good to us. It's a terrible thing to say, I know. But sometimes he's so good to us that we lack a dependency on him. And we start to depend on ourselves. First thing he says is trust in him. Trust in the Lord and do good. Now he's the one that defines good, not us. And I'm telling you right now, there's some things that I read about in scripture that I don't understand. They don't seem good to me, but they are good to him. Ananias and Sapphira, why did you kill them? They made a mistake, right? For us, that doesn't seem like it was good, but it was. It was good for the church to see that. And could Peter, who has already been given authority to raise people from the dead, could he have raised them up? But he didn't because that wouldn't have been good because the church was being established. These are hard sayings. These are hard things to understand. Why would God do that? Because of a lie. I'll tell you right now, the things that we say today, if God was still operating that way and the church was being established, like, Lord, I want Cross Life to be established as your true church. If we deviate from your word maliciously, then Lord, that you would slay us dead as an example to others that you are the only true and living God. People wouldn't want that. And God doesn't do that, at least not that quickly. But he did then to do good. God gets to define what good is, not us. And we can attribute to him our ideal of good. And then we say, if I can believe this enough, then all of a sudden this is now God's will, but in all reality, it's our will, not his. His ways are not our ways. And if we think that we have fully figured out God, we're fooling ourselves, truly. We are finite beings, he is an infinite God. Surely we can't think that we figured him out entirely. He's still got some things in reserve that surprise us, amen? Amen. Commit our ways unto the Lord. Kind of something simple. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways unto the Lord. Trust in him again and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who possess, uh, uh, prospereth in the way because, because of the man who bringeth wickedness, uh, wicked devices to pass. These folks that are out there, for instance, in our government, I'm not fretting about them. They're going to get judgment. And the Lord is going to take care of that without a shadow of a doubt. These people, I, I was thinking even the... With, when my wife and I were driving down the road and there was this sign, this billboard that says, stop human trafficking. And I just thought, Lord, why wouldn't you just kill them now? Just destroy them. I mean, they're, they're harming people. They're doing all this. His ways are not our ways because could he? Yes. yes. Is he evil for not doing it? No, he's not. Do we lack understanding? I hope we can admit that we do. I know that there is a great contrast that we're seeing in the world today and the church needs to rise up and be strong, have our wills aligned with his will and we'll see very effective prayers because we'll be operating directly in his will. And I've just taken a couple passages of scripture to look at this and, and we'll, 
go into more details next week into what these actually mean, but just to set this up, just because you believe something doesn't mean it's true. And no matter how much you tell yourself it's true, still doesn't make it true. Believers today are almost practicing where they take scripture out of context and they begin to say, this is what I believe. And I'm going to continue to pray this way and pray this way and pray this way. They have a lot in common with gender dysphoria because they're doing the same exact thing. They're calling something that isn't as if it were. And they're saying, I'm a man when they're a woman or a woman when they're a man. And they're saying, if I can continue to tell myself and continue to tell myself, well, we look at them and know that that is foolishness. How does it look when God looks down on us, his children who have his word and are guilty of doing the same thing of taking things out of context and saying that God is saying something that he's not saying. All throughout the Old Testament and even into the Gospels, do you know what they call that? Blasphemy. And we're to have no other gods before us. We certainly can't put ourselves before him. We're not to worship any graven image. And so taking God's word and looking at it uh, in a way that it's not what he's expressing is worshiping something else. And just to add the tagline in Jesus name, we're to be praying in his name because the third commandment was take not the Lord's name in vain. And many do, especially if they're saying they're a Christian, worshiping another Jesus, following another spirit, taking scripture out of context or a perverted version or a cult. There's a lot of dangers out there, brother, because brothers and sisters, because We're actually engaging with the world and we need to know truth. We need to, we need to be humble enough to say, okay, you know what? I didn't see that in its context. I'm pulling this out of the air. That's what I'll say. In our prayer life, I want it to become very strong and I can't do that for you. All I can do is is we can open up God's word. We can look at a few things. And I want, regardless of what happens to this preacher, I want for you to be able to endure in these last days. And when the Lord returns and, and, and looks for the faithful, that he finds you faithful, faithful to his word, faithful to the commission, faithful to endure, if you have to, persecution, or maybe even some suffering. I wish I had an encouraging word beyond this. And I know there's a lot of great preachers out there that want to, uh, to preach some awesome stuff. But I really want us not to have division in this small group. And if I have to, to show the whole church in scripture how we can have unity, how we can have unity, then I will. If there's only six of us left and we start over, then hallelujah. A remnant's a remnant. But I'll tell you right now, and I'll guarantee you this, on the authority of God's word and what he's called me to do, I will not sit idle by while blasphemy is entering into the church, while spirits are moving around, And while people are ignorantly doing things that they don't know, I pray that there's enough humility in us to be able to at least, at least listen to what this preacher is saying as I am your pastor and explore the possibility, the possibility that what I'm saying is absolutely correct. I pray. My desire is that we be whole. My desire is that we walk out here or yesterday or whenever you go out. Yesterday, I had a gentleman that walked by the house and I'm done. And uh, I thought it was pretty amazing, our conversation. He was a believer. Obviously, I'm a believer. And he had some things that were uh, 
not necessarily spot on, but he had a humble, he had a humble spirit to hear what scripture said and was able to correct himself, but he had the right heart. And then he said something about me because I mentioned about carrying, open carry, concealed carry, things like this. And he said, brother, I almost want to say something about that, but I don't want it to be contentious. And I said, brother, just with the very, the very concern that you have for that and the way you're trying to word this, you can go ahead and say it. I'm not going to be offended. And he said, I'm hoping, he says, I just sense this in my spirit that, that the Lord wants you to trust him more for protection, that you don't need a firearm. And I said, brother, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you for your honesty. I said, but you have to understand my experience is different than yours. And the Lord has called me to be a protector. And I served my country and was willing to give my life to fight against evil. And this thing that happened at the school last week, it wouldn't happen if I was there because I wouldn't allow it. There's no movie theater that that would happen in. There's no church building that that would happen in because I would give my life for those that I don't even know. Those were children. And he was like, I never thought about that. I never thought of it that way. I said, I could go into scripture on how we can protect loved ones in our home. I said, and I appreciate you saying that. And I appreciate your heart for sharing that with me. And he said, I really appreciate you serving the country. And I said, well, it was my, it was my pleasure. And after the end of the conversation, I thought it was kind of interesting because I did not expect this in the conversation. He says, I'm glad you're here. And I thought, oh brother, I'm glad you're here too. He said, we, you have all kinds of conversations with people, but you don't often have a conversation like this. I said, yeah. I said, there's people out there that can speak some pretty good Christianese, but this is real. He said, yeah, it's real. So even in the time of edifying and the heart was humble and you could actually examine scripture and desiring truth, and then even uh, willing to handle some reproof, I just know that my experience is different than his. And he never thought of it from that point of view. I'm just hoping that through this, as we go through this, that there was a lot of things that I had to unlearn myself and come to truth. And I want us to live in unity. And I know that you're, you know, there's some in here that are just now learning the word of God and, and, and the truth of God's word. And those of us that have been in the faith for a long period of time, I pray that we're not feeding them things that are going to harm them. Things that, things that they're going to have to unlearn at some point in time. Amen? Amen. Amen. I pray so many, Father, Lord, we give you all glory. Lord, I don't know if it's the, uh, the soberness of Memorial Day that makes my heart so sober in this, but Lord, I pray that your truth would prevail. Lord, thank you for the times of study. Thank you, Lord, for the tutelage of your spirit. Thank you, Lord, that uh, even though in the past it's been used in a derogatory tor uh, term, Lord, thank you that I am a contextualist. That I, I want to know what you say. I want to understand the context. I'm not interested in creating something that makes my prayer life sound good before men. But Lord, that my heart is pure. Lord, that is your desire for us all. And you've given us your word. Lord, why is it that we have the standard operating procedure, but so many people are operating in different ways? How is it that your church today in America can sit idly by while a preacher says that you made a huge mistake in the way you ministered to someone and yet they don't move. How is it, Lord, that people can say that they're 
gods and compare themselves to you, that they have your same incommunicable attributes that, that, that only you possess, but they claim to have them too. Lord, we pray for strength in these last days. And we know that there's a time that we will have to endure. Lord, I pray that we do not fall asleep in these days, that we do not find ourselves uh, thinking that you're going to tarry, but you most certainly will come in a time when we're not looking. Lord, I pray that we are always watchful of these things, of the times that we're in. Lord, that we would stay true to your word, that we would study to show ourselves approved unto you and not unto men, but unto you. Lord, my prayer for your church is that you would strengthen us by your spirit, by your might. Lord, that we would understand that we can do nothing apart from you. And Lord, that we are the branches and you are the vine. And we must stay integrally connected to you. Lord, I pray that you would protect your beloved children from these seducing spirits and these doctrines of demons that are entering into so many places. And Lord, as we engage with the body at large, Lord, I pray that we would be whole. Lord, that we would honor the commission and the authority that you've given us to cast out demons, to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Lord, not tempting you, but when we're on mission, should something happen and we were to drink something or handle something, Lord, that it would have no effect on us. And Lord, I pray that we would not exercise authority beyond what you have commissioned us to. But Lord, that we would be your humble servants, knowing that we're heirs, co-heirs with you. And that we are all also called children, but Lord, that we would understand that we are your children, not your Lord or your master. Mm. That you are our Adonai. Amen. You are our Lord Amen. and our God. Amen. And we honor you. And it's in Jesus' name, your name, the matchless name, the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Mm. And I hopefully God people say, Amen. 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 Amen.